So here's a thought. There is a very short piece of dialogue from Ingmar Bergman's The Seventh Seal that is arguably one of the most emblematic moments in the history of cinema. So what exactly makes this scene so special? The composition of an image that oppresses one of the characters and puts the other in a place of control? The palpable despair and angst that emerge from Max von Sydow's moving performance? The frontal opposition between darkness and light, between life and death? Yes, all of that, but also so much more. And to understand that, we need context. We need to look at the film as a whole. Set in medieval Sweden, the movie follows the steps of Antonius Bloch, a crusade knight returning home to the squire after taking part in the horrors of war, in what seems to have been a senseless effort since all he hears is the silence of God. Upon his return and encountering a plague devastated country, he dwells with the idea that the disease might be a final punishment from God. And to entertain this notion, arbitrary an idea as it may seem is to be hopeful. Hopeful that there is a God and that, therefore, the endeavors of war were purposeful and meaningful instead of vain acts of senseless cruelty. After all, we should all hope for God's wrath, however devastating it may be, when the alternative is the indifference of the universe and a meaningless existence leading to the void nothingness of death. The very despair that comes from just thinking about such a thing makes us cling to whatever form of meaning and hope we can get. Say, much like some of the best Woody Allen characters. So at the moment you don't believe in God? No, and I, I want to. You know, I'm, I'm willing to do anything. I'll, you know, I'll die Easter eggs if it works. I, I need some evidence. I gotta have some proof. You know what? If, if I can't believe in God, then I don't think life is worth living. It means making a very big leap. Yes, well, can, can you help me? In his 1986 drama, Hannah and Her Sisters, Alan plays his usual neurotic and hypochondriac persona through the character of Mickey Sachs. Drawing direct inspiration from Bergman, Alan emerges on screen as a man desperately facing death and the absurdity of life, an agonizing existence that urges a search for meaning, which he tries to fulfill by going shopping for religions. What makes you interested in becoming a Hare Krishna? Well, I'm not saying that I want to join or anything, but, but I know you guys believe in reincarnation, you know, so it interests me. Yeah, well, what's your religion? Well, I was born Jewish, you know, but, uh, but last winter I tried to become a Catholic and it didn't work for me. I, I studied and I tried and I gave it everything, but, you know, Catholicism for me was die now, pay later, you know, and I just couldn't get with it, and I, and I wanted to. You You're know, afraid I, of dying? Well, yeah, naturally, aren't you? I, let me ask you, in reincarnation, does that mean my soul would pass to another human being, or would I come back as a moose or an oddbark or something? Take our literature, uh -huh. read it over, and think about it. Well, okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Hare Krishna. In essence, the men from both narratives, one a medieval Swedish crusade knight and the other a Jewish TV producer born and raised in Brooklyn, are faced with the same issues and set themselves on the same quest for answers. While Mickey Sachs goes from Christianity to Buddhism trying to hold on to whatever form of faith he can find, Antonius Block drops to his knees in praise, and when nobody answers, we witness the birth of the modern man. In what can only be described as the work of a genius, Bergman conveys through a single camera movement in going from the image of the knight abandoned by God to the image of a chessboard, the leap from medieval faith to modern rational thinking. From resignating to a predetermined fate and accepting it as God's will to taking responsibility for your own life in such a manner that reason and logic become essential tools. So, when the personification of death appears to take the knight as he would eventually, he invites it to a game of chess. Villkoret är att jag får leva så länge jag står emot. Spelar jag i makt, förrör du mig. In becoming the master of his own destiny, Block gets to affirm himself in this world. Whatever may happen, either good or bad, will have been by his own doing, and this very notion breeds new life into him. Det är min hand. Jag kan röra den. 
Blodet pulserar i den. Solen står fortfarande högt på himlen. Och jag... Jag, Antonius Block... ...spelar schack med döden. While this newly gained conscience of self-determination does provide the knight with an honest feeling of freedom and liberation, reason, knowledge and logic alone will not allow for the sort of cathartic redemption that he seeks through finding meaning. Because the meaning of life doesn't lie on such things. Because knowledge and reason are not ends in themselves, just as much as they shouldn't serve the sole and petty purpose of improving the life of a single man or of a select few. For we have seen where this leads and what it can look like. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. The forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. Tonight I want to talk to you on a subject of deep concern to all Americans and to many people in all parts of the world, the war in Vietnam. In so many ways, it's very important to remember that in the making of the Seventh Seal, Bergman had just witnessed the horrors that a misplaced sense of reason could lead to, and how human ingenuity can serve the most obscure purposes. If anything, World War II showed him how, much in the same way as medieval fundamentalism, reason, science and logic can sometimes amount to the horrific persecution and the killing of millions of people. I I wrote this uh, Seven Seal. And uh, the Seven Seal is about death the whole time. Death turns up right at the death, very beginning death, of the film. Yeah. Death is uh, present the whole time in this picture, and everybody in this picture reacts differently to death. And after that uh, picture, of course, I still think very much about this. But after that picture, it's not an obsession anymore. I, I, uh, I just can live with it. So that uh, the picture was a good medicine, if you if that what what you meant. Once the context in which Bergman developed the Seventh Seal becomes clear, we can begin to understand Bloch's quest in dealing with death and his search for meaning as Bergman's own story and journey in life. Such a perspective makes one particular character in the movie all the more important and central. It's no other than the acrobat Joff that Bloch and his squire meet in their travelings. A true artist, Joff defies gravity with his acts just as much as he defies the severity of death with his laughter and joy. And it's through this character that Bergman offers us a truly sublime moment. I'm talking, of course, about the moment that Joff has a vision and sees the Holy Mary walking baby Jesus. In the midst of an apocalypse, the artist sees what no one else sees. He sees the face of God. And if in so many ways Antonius Bloch mirrors Bergman himself, how emblematic it is that only in the presence of Joff, Bloch gets to find some peace. Mikael som ligger och sover. Joff med sitt stränga spel. Och detta ska vara mitt tecken. Och en stor tillräcklighet. It's remarkable how Bloch is only truly in peace with existence when in the presence of the acrobat in his family. When he experiences art and the beautiful idea that it shall pass on from father to son and so on. Whatever you may call it, when Bloch meets Joff and his family, he becomes hopeful. And that's the power of art, to bring hope in the darkest of times. Because no matter how challenging times may be, and for us, now, at the present moment, they certainly are and feel challenging. Thus far, humanity has always been able to strive and overcome through art and through hope. Hope not in some external power or theistic source of protection, but hope in ourselves as a brotherhood. The kind of hope that only a true artist can perceive. The kind of hope that once perceived by an artist is transmitted upon us in the most sublime form. 
While the plot of the narrative may center on its main character's quest for answers and meaning, the movie offers no resolution for those. Because in life we have none. What it gives us instead is the hope that future generations will have it better than we did and that art is the light that shines to guide us on that path. Once Antunas Block sees that, once he understands he's been asking the wrong questions this whole time and that he's been placing his faith in all the wrong places, he is finally able to find peace in sacrificing his life for that which really matters, his fellow man, the future of mankind, and the hopes of a better tomorrow. Just in the same way that, in Hannah and Her Sisters, Mickey Sachs finds his comfort and reason to keep on living while watching a Marx Brothers movie in the cinema. And I went upstairs to the balcony and I sat down. And, you know, the movie was a, a film that I'd seen many times in my life since I was a kid. And, and I always uh, loved it. And, you know, I'm, I'm watching these people up on the screen and I started getting hooked on the film, you know? And I started to feel, how can you even think of killing yourself? I mean, isn't it so stupid? I mean, look at all the people up there on the screen, you know? They're real funny. And, and what if the worst is true? What if there's no God and you only go around once and that's it? Well, you know, don't you want to be part of the experience? You know, what the hell, it, it's not all a drag. And I'm thinking to myself, Geez, I should stop ruining my life searching for answers I'm never gonna get and just enjoy it while it lasts. And, you know, after, who knows? I mean, you know, maybe there is something. Nobody really knows. Yeah, I, know, I know maybe is a very slim read to hang your whole life on, but that's the best we have. And then I started to sit back and I actually began to enjoy myself. <laughs> After getting to the point of contemplating suicide, a silly move is what reconnects Mickey back with the world and allows him to find love. Again, that's the power of art. It's also important to notice that neither Block nor Mickey find the reason of their lives in art. Because like science and knowledge, art is not an end in itself. Instead, it is the very thing that reconciles them back with the world. It is the thing that brings them back to reality, allowing them to reconnect with people. Learning that the meaning they've been seeking has always been around them. With both Allen's and Bergman's movies in mind, I can't help but being left with the very strong feeling that art is one of the ultimate expressions of the human experience. Through it we can hope to achieve wonders beyond the boundaries and limitations of the physical world and the natural laws. <laughs> Men det blir ett konststycke. Att få ena bollarna och stanna helt stilla i luften. Det är omöjligt. Ja, för oss är det omöjligt. Men inte för honom. In the end, art is one of the things that keeps on pushing us forward. This crazy, insane idea, a madman perception of reality, which no one else sees but the artist himself, that the children of tomorrow will have the ability to defy the laws of gravity. <sighs> Seems to me I've heard that song before It's from an old